Hello all you happy people and welcome to Cinematic Excrement and the continuation of my quest to review every movie that has won the Razzie for Worst Picture. And I'm really not looking forward to this one. I'm sure I've said this before, but I rarely enjoy reviewing bad comedies. There are only so many ways that you can say, this is not funny. But, well, this is not funny. Released in 2018, Holmes and Watson was written and directed by Aiton Cohen, not to be confused with Ethan Cohen. Oh no, oh <laughs> lord no, I wish. To be fair, Ethan Cohen does have screenwriting credits for movies that are highly thought of, like Idiocracy, Tropic Thunder, and The Bad Guys. But for those films, he shared screenwriting duties with at least one other person. Holmes and Watson is all him. Which means there is very little confusion regarding who is to blame. Of course, the movie is based on probably the best-known fictional detective, Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle over a century ago. The character and his adventures have been adapted for both the big and small screens more times than I care to count. And now that all of Doyle's stories of the famous detective are in the public domain, that's probably not going to change anytime soon. You know Hollywood loves not having to pay for shit. They certainly don't like paying their writers. While he wasn't the first to play the role on the big screen, Basil Rathbone's performance as Sherlock Holmes is arguably the most iconic, beginning back in 1939 with The Hound of the Baskervilles, based on the novel of the same name. He would go on to play the character in 13 more films, which sadly resulted in him getting typecast. But he was so good in this role. Intelligent, observant, supremely confident in his abilities, and a penchant for the theatrics. Of course, more recently, the character was played by Robert Downey Jr. in Guy Ritchie's Sherlock Holmes and its sequel, A Game of Shadows. I remember liking them at the time, though I confess I don't remember much about them apart from the slow motion fight scenes. And of course, there was that really weird Asylum mockbuster, which I also kind of enjoyed, believe it or not. I certainly wouldn't call it a good movie, and it has a really weird plot involving a robotic dinosaur. No, really. But it's one of the Asylum's better efforts, and it was kind of fun. It's on Peacock if you have it. Anyway, this all leads up to the subject of today's review. It was first reported in 2008, yes, we appear to have another case of development hell on our hands, that a Sherlock Holmes comedy was in the works starring Sasha Baron Cohen as the legendary detective and Will Ferrell as his assistant, Dr. Watson, with Judd Apatow producing. That doesn't sound altogether unpleasant, considering those three had great success with Talladega Nights, The Ballad of Ricky Bobby. Unfortunately, at some point in the following decade, Baron Cohen and Apatow left the project, and Farrell transitioned into playing Holmes, with John C. Riley stepping in as Watson. Still, not necessarily a bad sign, as those two have worked together before, with pretty good results in the aforementioned Talladega Nights, and with just okay results in Step Brothers. Unfortunately, even just okay was out of reach for Holmes and Watson. This was an abject failure. The movie opens with a fake quote about logic and truth, attributed to an episode of Hannah Montana. I've never actually seen the show, but I feel pretty confident in assuming this quote is fake. From minute one, we are already in trouble. Then we get a brief look at Sherlock's childhood, where he arrives at school and is immediately bullied mercilessly. After he's finally pushed too far, he becomes the ultimate tattletale and has all the other kids expelled, except for John Watson. So the bullied becomes the bully. Not sure that's the right lesson. Then we fast forward to Moriarty, on trial for murder and played by Rafe Fiennes? Oh god, how did they get him in this mess? He's about to be set free as all of the witnesses have mysteriously disappeared. Holmes may have some testimony that can convict Moriarty, but he's sadly far too busy trying on hats. Oh god, really? I know it was 2018, but really? We're doing this in a Sherlock Holmes movie? Now I assure you, no one likes a good Trump joke more than I but please note the qualifier, good. And this isn't even the only bad Trump joke in the movie. They do this shit more than once, but I digress. Holmes is delayed further when Moriarty attempts to kill him and Watson with a plague-ridden mosquito, which they have a great deal of trouble killing and mostly just smack each other in the face. Behold, hijinks. And I cannot make sense of this. Let's say the mosquito bites Holmes. What then? He's testifying in like 10 minutes. Yeah, he'll still die eventually, but it won't stop him from testifying and sending Moriarty to jail. How is this plan from the alleged criminal mastermind supposed to work? What plague could it possibly infect him with that would kill him instantly? If the plague kills him too quickly, it can't spread. Even before COVID, I think most people understood that's not how plagues work. Anyway, they narrowly escape almost certain malaria and Watson repeatedly fires his gun in the courtroom for no apparent reason. 
and the world's greatest detective, no, not that one, offers up some masturbation jokes, don't ask, and concrete proof that Moriarty is not the killer. This Moriarty is an imposter, a look-alike set up to take the fall. Well, that was stupid. The actual Moriarty shows up occasionally in the movie, but his presence is utterly pointless as, spoiler alert, he's not even the main villain. More on that later. This is so disappointing. Fiennes is a great actor and his talents are wasted here. And he's not the only wasted talent, as the movie also features cameos from Steve Coogan and Hugh Laurie, both uncredited as I assume they did not want their names attached to this mess, and I don't blame them. Moving on, another case almost literally falls into Sherlock's lap, and he and Watson are tasked with solving a plot to murder the Queen. They are joined by two women from America, where Moriarty has presumably gone into hiding. They are Dr. Grace Hart, played by Rebecca Hall, and her assistant, Millicent, played by Lauren Lapkus. And, of course, they are astounded at the prospect of a woman becoming a doctor, because if the masturbation jokes didn't already clue you in, low-hanging fruit is as high as this movie can reach. And it gets worse. Per Dr. Hart, Millie was raised by feral cats and has the mental capacity of a four-year-old, and Holmes immediately falls in love with her. Oh dear. Am I the only one who thinks this is a little yeesh? She's mentally a child, and Holmes is flirting with and fantasizing about her, and the more I think about this, the more I want everyone involved with this movie to die. Now at the end of the movie, we find out Millie was acting and she's actually a perfectly normal grown woman. And if you're wondering why she was pretending to be stupid, I have no idea. This big reveal has no effect on the plot whatsoever. There's a part of me that suspects someone involved with this movie pointed out how gross it was that Holmes was infatuated with, for all intents and purposes, a child, and they made a last minute change to fix this. But the version of Millie that Holmes fell in love with was still the mentally challenged version, so I am not rescinding my yeesh. The yeesh stands. There also appears to be a thing between doctors Watson and Hart, and at least there's nothing problematic there. This leads to them turning the autopsy of the murder victim into a ghost parody complete with unchained melody. Wait, how do they have unchained melody in the early 20th century? Space is warped and time is bendable. After that nonsense, we proceed to... more nonsense. Holmes tests a theory that the victim was poisoned by poisoning Watson and watching what happens to him, which leads to Watson dancing around like a crazy person, and I'm almost certain Riley improvised most of this. Temporary brain damage. Temporary brain damage would explain how this movie came to be. And then the movie just kind of wanders aimlessly for a while. They send a drunken telegram, they do cocaine and throw a medicine ball around, they accidentally brain the queen with a camera and try to stuff her into a trunk for some reason, Watson somehow ends up in a wrestling match after confronting a suspect. Mate Braun. Oh, he's wrestling Braun Strowman. Oh, it actually is Braun Strowman. And Bruce Buffer. And Michael Buffer? I think we wandered into a different movie. What the hell is going on here? And for the better part of an hour, I am left wondering if something is ever going to happen. I don't expect a Sherlock Holmes mystery to be solved right away, but I do expect the story to actually, you know, progress. And yet, it refuses to do so. The movie has an astounding amount of padding, considering it only runs about 90 minutes. It's economical not to have a storyline, because then you can just film people saying things. <laughs> anyway, when the plot finally decides to clock back in, Holmes initially concludes Watson is the murderer because apparently this version of Holmes is an idiot. But he quickly recognizes his mistake and concludes, correctly this time, that his housekeeper Mrs. Hudson, who we've only seen a couple of times so far, is the actual murderer. He also figures out that Mrs. Hudson is the daughter of Moriarty, and she planned to murder the Queen to impress her father. It is in no way clear how Holmes figures this out. He simply does because the story says he must. Usually, Sherlock Holmes explains how he figures out the identity of the perpetrator, but clearly they are not going for the traditional approach. Or indeed, a competent one. And Holmes and Watson stop Mrs. Hudson from killing the Queen on board the Titanic. Why the Titanic? Honestly, I have no idea what the joke was supposed to be here. Clearly this was funny to someone, but I'll be damned if I understand why. Hell, I could say that about most of the jokes in this movie, especially this lame gag. I'm gonna crush your heads. There's gonna be brains everywhere, and I'll no be cleaning up after. I know you're threatening me, but I can't understand a word you're saying. I'm gonna crush your head, there's gonna be brains everywhere, and I'll not be cleaning up after. If I can understand the accent, it ain't that thick.
There are also some bizarre running gags involving onions and Watson being uncomfortably horny for the Queen for some reason, and they do several parodies of the slow motion sequences from the Guy Ritchie movies, which might have been funny if they weren't seven years too late. And there's a thing where Watson keeps hoping Holmes will name him co-detective, and Holmes repeatedly shoots him down, and that might have been funny if it didn't so closely resemble the relationship between Ricky Bobby and Cal Naughton Jr. in Talladega Nights, with Riley's character desperately wanting to be seen as equal to Farrell's. You're stealing a joke from probably the most well-known movie those two have done together. Did you think no one would notice? But for my money, the most bizarre element of the movie is the musical number. Yeah, you heard me. This movie features a musical duet between Farrell and Riley, written by Alan fucking Menken of all people. And honestly, it's probably the best part of the movie, although that's not saying a lot. Menken has done better, but considering what he had to work with, I'm amazed it turned out as well as it did. Well, that's Holmes and Watson. It's every bit as bad as I've heard. It's painfully unfunny with an uninspired story and a plot that struggles to fill its 90 minute runtime. The shit with Holmes and Millie was super cringe, and the movie can't seem to decide how it wants to portray its two leads. They seem to switch back and forth between intelligent and stupid depending on what the filmmakers found funny in the moment. It's inconsistent and lazy and a waste of time for everyone involved. I know Farrell and Riley can be funny, I've seen them do it, but this was a total misfire. The movie was nominated for six Razzies and took home Worst Picture, Worst Director for Aiton Cohen, Worst Supporting Actor for John C. Riley, which I do not agree with. His acting was fine, he just wasn't funny. And Worst Remake, Ripoff, or Sequel, which makes no sense as it is none of those. In fact, that's true for most of the nominees in that category. It's remarkable. Holmes and Watson is definitely lazy, but not as lazy as the 39th Golden Raspberry Awards. The Razzies have always been crap, but I think this was one of their worst years. The acting awards in particular are littered with nominees and winners that fall into one of two categories. First, good actors who happen to be in bad movies. For example, John Travolta in Gotti. That movie was not well made and spent most of its runtime glorifying a mob boss. Barf. But Travolta's performance was one of its few redeeming qualities. He did not deserve this. And Helen Mirren for Winchester? How dare you? And second, people who weren't acting at all. Worst actor and worst supporting actress went to Donald Trump and Kellyanne Conway, who appeared in documentary stock footage in Death of a Nation and Fahrenheit 11.9. They also gave worst screen combo to Donald Trump and his self-perpetuating pettiness. Putting aside the fact that we are yet again nominating screen combos that are not actual screen combos, how do you give acting awards to non-actors? Again, no one likes a good Trump joke more than I do, but this is just lazy. And if you really wanted to take some pot shots at Trump and his enablers, Death of a Nation was right there. You easily could have nominated it for awards that it actually deserved. How did that not get a Worst Picture or Worst Director nomination? Apart from Trump's bullshit acting awards, all it got were nominations for Worst Screenplay, Losing to Fifty Shades Freed, I Demand a Recount, and Worst Remake, Ripoff, or Sequel. And like Holmes and Watson, it is none of those things. The more I look at the entirety of this award show, the more I wonder if they got anything right. But I will say Holmes and Watson is the clear winner among the Worst Picture nominees. Gotti, Winchester, and Robin Hood were just mediocre. Brian Henson's The Happy Time Murders is the only other nominee that is genuinely horrible. And I'm surprised Jim didn't come back from the grave to smack the shit out of Brian. Admittedly, I cannot picture a man like Jim Henson ever raising a hand to one of his children, but I think he would have made an exception for this. But Holmes and Watson was worse, and I'll tell you why. There were times during Holmes and Watson where the movie went so far off the rails that I could have sworn the director lost the script and said, Fuck it, we'll just film whatever. The Happy Time Murders, at the very least, told a coherent story and more or less kept it moving from beginning to end. It's not a good story, mind you, it's crap. It has a half-baked racism metaphor, it portrays a cop who accidentally murdered someone as the hero, and I don't think I laughed once, but at no point did I wonder where the plot had wandered off to. It's a low bar, low enough to trip over. And yet, Holmes and Watson still failed to clear it. And that's why it's the worst picture among the 2018 nominees. Death of a Nation was still worse overall, but I've said enough about that and let's never speak of it again. Next time, we're moving on to 2019 and the 40th Golden Raspberry Awards. And the winner that year... Oh boy. Until then, I am the Smeghead, and Hollywood needs to pay their writers.
Of course she's not the killer. She's an American. She would have used a gun. Ah. 